Okay, everybody, you're all very welcome. Welcome today to our workshop, uh, to our presentation, sub five meter location accuracy in open spaces using LoRa 2.4 gigahertz. My name's Albert Baker. Uh, we're delighted to be here at the Things Conference and we've a lot to get through in the next 60 minutes or so. Um, so we're going to get right into it. So during the next hour, we're going to hear from different partners all about how LoRa at 2.4 gigahertz has been used in the real world for a tracking use case. It's a personnel tracking use case, in fact. And we have demonstrated um, less than five meter accuracy uh, independent of any other tracking technology. Pretty exciting, we think. So we're, we're really looking forward to hear your thoughts and hear your questions. Uh, so how is this all brought together? So we at Donalto, we collaborated with best in class hardware partners to see through our objectives and prove this technology out. So um, Donalto, we are an IoT technology firm. We're based in Dublin in Ireland. Um, I'm a co-founder. We focus very much on low power wide area networks for about five years now. And we have a keen interest in uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, we provide uh, firmware and software at the device edge and cloud uh, layers to uh, bring these tracking use cases to life. So we provide a distributed IoT platform and we're embedding firmware at the device and gateway layer, as I said, and making available geolocation engines in the cloud to solve for the location of each tag on the system. So we've deployed the system locally in Ireland for remote customer tests due to COVID-19. Last year was challenging to really deploy on customer sites. This is all around use case um, in open pit mining um, for personnel tracking for health and safety reasons. Um, so it's going to move on the slide here. So today, We'll be joined um, by Alex Raimondi, CEO of Miramico. This is our tag partner, uh, Dan Quant, VP of Strategic Development for Multitech, to give us all our uh, information about the gateway and the edge layer of this solution. And we have Khaled Hassan as well from the Donalto team, our, our IoT scientist, who will go through some of the technical performance of the solution. So to, just to begin, I have a short video just to run through again um, how this solution was brought to life and where it was tested in Ireland. You can see it.
So. Okay. Make sure I'm moving on here. Okay, so um, LoRa 2.4, why is that of interest to us? So LoRa 2.4 gigahertz tracking brings huge benefits with it, namely ultra low power and higher bandwidth compared to sub gigahertz LoRa. And we at Tenalto, we've developed components on the MiroMiko um, tag, the FMLOR ADU STL4, which enable advanced ranging, downlink comms and firmware upgrade over the air for the purpose of making these tags capable of natively reporting locations. So that's key for us, okay? So only over this LoRa 2.4 network. We're using, we're interrogating radio signals on this specific network to determine location. That, that's uh, key to this. Um, Alexander will delve more into how the hardware works and Khaled can give some uh, background on the, um, on the technical performance scene and some of the accuracies and how we've brought these tags to life for asset and personnel tracking. So this is really um, where you know, our, uh, our partner ecosystem has come to life and this has uh, helped us bring this, um, bring this along. So on the device layer, as I said, uh, Alex can delve more into the tag here and um, what is actually uh, done on that side. On the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on the edge side, uh, we're using multi-tech gateways, um, and Dan will provide more information um, as part of today's sessions as well. Um, one point to note, uh, which many people may already know, now that we're talking about the 2.4 gigahertz band, this is deployable across the globe, and we've, and we've seen this as a significant uh, benefit when looking to deploy. It's a single solution that can address IoT tracking regarding of the geography. Um, so this is where multi-tech have been key for our uh, success in this project. On the cloud side, this is where um, Donalto is um, integral to the solution. We have our geolocation engine, our solver engine here, and we actually have an application as well, which we will show. Um, and if you stick around afterwards around the booth, we can give a live demo of this as well. So I'm delighted to introduce Alex Raimondi from uh, MiroMiko, who will be able to walk us through more on the tag side. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Albert, for the introduction. So my name is Alex Raimondi. I'm CEO of MiroMiko in Zurich. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, first, I will give you a short introduction about MiroMiko, what we do and where we are heading to. So MiroMiko has been founded uh, 20 years ago at a spin-off of ETH in Zurich. Um, we have three departments. One is doing integrated ASIC design. This is high-speed analog mixing on ASIC with uh, speeds up to 100 gigabits or even more in a latest, greatest technology. Um, in the other two departments, which are headed by me, we are doing embedded system design and IoT. Embedded system design is mainly doing custom-based project, customer specification, turn them into electronics, turn into full-fledged device, help them with production and um, everything that has to do with electronic lifecycle management. IoT is our latest strong focus where we have where we take care of battery operated wireless devices with long range communication or even also wired communication with a focus on LoRaWAN, but also um, dealing with proprietary 2.4 gigahertz or other kind of protocols and technologies. In all cases, we support our customers from the idea into product development over to um, mass production and also market introduction, product life cycle management. We take care of their supply production for high volume and also uh, quality assurance, quality management for the product. So they, including housing, everything, full-fledged devices, they will buy their own devices with us, fully tested, qualified from production. Next slide. So um, we are strong hardware partner. We focus on hardware. Um, 
uh, including mass production and production. So we have a supply chain partner network set up within in Europe. We also do production in China and we also take care of the entire product life cycle, which means also replacing components once um, they, they reach end of life and also doing supply for high volume, especially this year, we have to do a lot of, of planning to actually get our customers ready with their devices as the supply chain at the moment is uh, once due to COVID or is it due to high request in IoT is quite challenging to manage. Um, next slide. Our products, of course, are targeting for all types of verticals, transportation, energy management, house, smart homes, smart homes, smart cities. We as hardware partner, we strongly focus on, on the hardware. So our customers actually are attacking the verticals with their solutions. So once some of our partners are picked in the logos down, we have one big project with Swiss Post where we deliver currently up to almost 100,000 devices to Swiss households. We have also strong connection with Semtech and work with companies such as Roche and a supplier partner, Fnet. And we also had some interesting use cases uh, with WWF where we could deploy trackers on bisons in yeah. part in mountains and other um, projects. Next slide. We are a wireless company. So this means we are working from uh, low frequency RFID up to um, all the high frequency and long range um, protocols um, or technologies. So RFID, for example, for close range identification data communication. Of course, we also do uh, all the standard protocols such as Bluetooth, Threat, ZigBee, Wi-Fi, if battery, if battery or power consumption allows. But we have, a, we have developed a very strong focus uh, given by the past projects we have done with, with uh, LoRa, LoRaWAN, uh, LoRa in 2.4 gigahertz proprietary or, and cost, uh, or uh, already specified protocols. We also do IoT devices with narrowband IoT and Sigfox and 4G. So what are we working on or where are, where are our common strengths? So we have developed a, a module, a family, a, a module of a family of uh, wireless modules so that our customer can easily integrate all the different uh, chipsets from Semtech into their system with, with uh, seamless migration between the different, um, different frequencies or technologies. Um, all the food, all the modules share a common fr footprint, except the very smallest LoRaWAN LoRa module in the world, which we introduced at the TTN conference last year. It is our S61261 based Maxim module. All the other modules share a common footprint and um, are using same same tech transceiver, either sub G or 2.4 gigahertz. We are working with different MCU vendors such as STM, Maxim, and Renaissance. Um, the modules feature some additional options such as UFL connector for the antenna. We have variation with chip antenna, or if you want to do your own antenna on your PCB, you can use the antenna pad on board. Um, we also offer um, vari various uh, selections of onboard flash or sensors such as humidity sensor or even accelerometer. And all the modules allow a seamless transition between different frequencies and technologies. Next one. The mo one module I wanted to point out is, is which is linked to the Donalto use case is our um, 2.4 gigahertz LoRa module. It features uh, S61280 in combination with a Cortex M M4 from ST for high performance um, ranging applications such as Donalto is doing. We also offer um, a lower cost variation given some uh, certain MOQ where you can reduce cost if your protocol is, seems to be quite easy. Um, of course, if you want to go further down in cost and don't need any kind of ranging, you can also have the same module with a 1281. Um, for ranging applications such as Tonalto is doing, we also offer the T60 for increased um, Clock stability on the ranging in the ranging application, and with, together with Donaldo, we uh, in, uh, 
we developed the tag application, which you saw in the video, which is in this IP65 housing that features our module together with uh, some additional peripheral components such as buzzer, such as buzzer and, and accelerometer and sensors. Next slide. Another nice thing we can do with our S61280 module is we can integrate a Bluetooth low energy stack, which is a fully compliant BLE stack uh, ported by our partner Blue Kitchen. It supports a uh, peripheral role of the Bluetooth stack and it's completely running in the MCU on the module and is footprint wise it's small enough so it's small enough so that it even allows dual stack application. So you could use BLE for configuration purposes to uh, do the configuration over a mobile phone and for the real application you can have a LoRa, LoRa or a, 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 a proprietary wireless stack on it. Yeah. On the next we will show you a short video about how the Bluetooth is working. Okay, I'll just take you back to your slides, Alex. Thank you. Okay, other applications we have done with Bluetooth is this interesting uh, use case where we embed um, electronics with Bluetooth, with a Bluetooth chipset inside the golf ball. So the one of the biggest pain in golf is uh, you have to, if you, you lose your ball and you have to find it for um, to continue your play or otherwise you will get penalty strokes. So with embedding Bluetooth inside the ball and building a high quality golf ball around it allows every user to just track the ball with, with a smartphone. The tracking uh, compared to whatever Donaldo is doing is here solely based on RSSI tracking. So we measure the signal strength from the ball and the closer you get, the stronger the signal is. So it's easily to navigate yourself through in a, on a golf course to uh, go close to your golf ball. Next one. Other applications we do in mainly in the LoRaWAN uh, use spaces is uh, tracking applications. We are we have a very small tracker which is basically developed for uh, birds, so for bird tracking, like wandering birds. Um, the LoRaWAN tracker is around six grams. It features a solar panel together with a with a rechargeable battery, and if it's carried by the bird, it can live almost autonomously without um, for years so we can actually follow the bird on the path from Europe to Africa and back. This, the same technology of course we use in industrial tracker where it's probably for cargo cases where you can track containers or truck trucks or we also do other use cases um, which are involved in tracking. Next one. Now back to the Donalto use case, we, as, as Albert already pointed out, we built the hardware, which is the core of the application. And Donalto is working on the firmware and doing all the ranging applications on top of it. 
And with that, I would like to hand back to Albert. Thank you very much, Alex. So, as you can see, you know, best-in-class partners like Miro Miko, they're absolutely key for Donalto and for, you know, to be able to bring these solutions out. So for anyone that's joined just now, we're looking at um, asset and personnel tracking using LoRa at 2.4 gigahertz and achieving less than five meters accuracy. So that was our device. So we are going to move on to our edge layer now, and I'm delighted to introduce Dan Quant, who's going to run through some detail here. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Albert. And a big shout out to the Things Conference team for another great event this year. So Laura typically uses, if you move on to the next slide, Laura typically uses sub gigahertz spectrum to enable that best trade-off between range, battery life, and cost. Spectrum below one gigahertz has great propagation characteristics and it's ideal for public macro networks and private enterprise networks in a given region. Unfortunately, there isn't a common ISM band that goes across the whole world in that sub gig, that below one gigahertz range. Although not nearly as fragmented as cellular, um, with nearly 100 bands now um, across all the regions, and, and I mean, there's more of them coming with 5G, but it's still not perfect if, if you're a highly mobile asset. If you're something like cargo, logistics, the vehicles that carry that cargo, if you're trying to develop a single SKU product that, that you don't know where it's gonna ship to and you want it to work anywhere in the world, then you have a little bit of a challenge with LoRa with these few different channel plans across the world. So yes, 2.4 gig LoRa is ideally suited for global mobility and shipments into multiple regions, even using mobile gateways that move between regions on ships, trucks, and planes. But there's more to 2.4 gig LoRa. There are a few different KPIs that really enable stranded and often underserved assets to become connected using LoRa technology. This is about being able to connect more assets, to be able to digitize more of an enterprise's operations. Um, and, and, and LoRa is well placed to take that market. It has a better set of KPIs and can differentiate itself against other low power wireless access technologies in the market. So 2.4 gig isn't all about global logistics. It's, it's really about connecting those stranded assets. And some of the KPIs of 2.4 gigahertz is the, um, is the higher data rate. You can get up to 63 kilobits per second on the top end. And, and although that's not broadband, ultra low latency connectivity, that certainly buys you into just a few more use cases, use cases that were stranded, that, that wanted low power wireless access, but just couldn't quite get there. And it enables better localization and, uh, and tracking of assets. And, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Khaled in a moment. And partly that's because there's no on-air time restrictions. I know some regions, some of those channel plans in some situations can remove the on-air time restrictions, but generally speaking with LoRa, you generally have a, a, um, a duty cycle or on-air time restriction. With 2.4 gig, you don't. You can stay on channel for longer periods of time. And for sure, it's not gonna give you the long range that that sub one gigahertz band is gonna give you, but it does give you better range than the incumbent technologies in the 2.4 gig band. It has superior interference and, and coexistence properties courtesy of the LoRa physical layer. So let's have a little look at the channel plan. If, uh, if we jump to the next slide. So the ISM band is about an 80 meg band uh, sitting in 2.4 gig. And as we all know, it's used predominantly for Wi-Fi and for Bluetooth. 
those Wi-Fi channels, they start at the beginning of the band and they overlap each other going through the band. And so clearly the least amount of interference occurs at the very bottom end of the channel where you only have one Wi-Fi channel um, overlaying that, that um, area of spectrum. And the same is true at the high end. So for that reason, two of the three channels were put at the um, opposite ends of the band in order to enjoy least interference, which is very similar to how Bluetooth works um, with the um, uh, adv advertising channels. And then the, uh, the, the second channel here, which is about one third in on the spectrum, uh, that's a little bit further in, but typically routers, they tend to default to channels one, six and 11. And typically, the channels used for Wi-Fi tend to be a little bit higher. So statistically, there's a little less noise ar around that area. And that's again, why you see that Bluetooth advertising channel there. Now, Bluetooth works across the entire ISM band and, and it works every other megahertz. So it's a one meg um, signal and it fills the first meg and then there's a guard band, if you like, in the second meg, and then the next channel comes along in the third meg and so on. And so with LoRa at 2.4 gig, we've interleaved uh, an 800K channel into those, um, those spare slots um, within Bluetooth. Um, in a nutshell, mandatory three join channels on the uplink and one RX window channel um, on the downlink. So let's move to the next slide. For many of you, this was probably your first LoRaWAN gateway that you used. It was the first fully indoor um, programmable LoRa gateway on the market back in 2014. It works in many, many different ways. It can act as a packet forwarder um, to, to a centralized or, or public macro network used by many operators. It some supports basic station now um, in, in software version 5.3.0. It's being used in that configuration with Amazon, for example, and the, uh, the new service that they've just deployed for LoRa. And it also can, um, process data internally from LoRa uh, um, endpoints and sensors, which then enables uh, data to be processed at the edge and, and directly integrated into local, often isolated systems, distributed control systems, and on-prem or cloud-based data management platforms, which is particularly powerful um, for enterprises, particularly in smaller building or campus-based environments where they don't have to pay um, compute cost and storage cost in the cloud, and they dramatically reduce the amount of backhaul um, going back to their uh, data management systems. We connect a lot of different interfaces, wired and wired, wired and wireless, um, on the Conduit platform, including most all of the uh, bands for LoRaWAN. And now we're supporting 2.4 gig. Actually, we've been supporting it for about a year now on this platform, and you, you see the part number of the card there that supports 2.4 gig. So let's have a little look at that card. If we uh, jump to the next slide. So we've created a three plus one card. So as you saw from the channel plan, that's three uplink channels and one downlink channel. All of those channels are at 812 kilohertz. And, and that's very important because anything over 500 kilohertz means that we can get around the dwell time, the on-air time restrictions, which means that we can be on the channel indefinitely. And um, we're also transmitting at a max output power of 10 dBm. So again, this is not designed for macro networks covering whole countries. It's designed for um, buildings, uh, vehicles, uh, and, and campus-like deployments. So 10 dBm is very important as well, because that's the other piece of the equation that enables us to stay on channel indefinitely and not be subjected to on-air channel restrictions. 
it's mandatory with the first three channels to use spread in factor 12. That therefore gets you the best range that you're gonna get in the 2.4 gig band and, and it's getting you about 1.2 um, kilobits per second. We've modeled on this particular card um, with our partners at uh, Semtech, we've modeled that we, can, we think we can get about 500 devices per unit. We've got a number of these units out in deployment today, um, but they're early pox and trials, so they're not such uh, dense deployments yet. We've also been looking at six plus one cards where you would then have another three channels which you could back off to spread in factor 10 maybe or even all the way down to spread in factor uh, five and, and get the uh, full 63 kilobit per second uh, throughput on there. So these cards are available today and we've been using them in a num number of evaluations and trial deployments. Uh, next slide please. So here's a typical deployment of a network. So you see the asset tracking tag there. Um, they would be connected to those conduit gateways, either an outdoor or an indoor variant of the conduit gateway. And, and that then gets packet forwarded into the Things Industries uh, 2.4 gig network server. And of course, Device HQ is there in order to be able to manage um, the, the gateways and, and be able to scale fleets of those gateways out. Um, of course, the gateways are running lens. So absolutely, you could go from sensor to gateway and directly to a data management platform as well. Right, next slide. So uh, as is the tradition at the Things Conference, Multitech likes to announce its newest, latest and greatest. So we've developed a next gen industrial programmable gateway. Um, you asked, we listened, and, uh, and this platform is much, much more powerful. Um, it enables up to 16 LoRa channels, also has those plug-in cards, so you can continue to plug in 2.4 gig, for example. You can uh, plug in wired and other uh, proprietary wireless interfaces into this gateway. All models have GNSS, optional Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. In mounted, so all of the interfaces are at the front. It's very simple to be able to interface with this platform. But the real innovation is the security. And uh, we've put in a, a lot of secure features with secure bootloaders, um, handling and storing of certificates, uh, access control. Uh, redundant and encrypted firmware and also it has a docker and container architecture and this is a, a true revolution in how LoRa gateways are going to perform here in this industrial side of the market because it truly enables more processing and compute at the edge, more machine learning and AI algorithms, microservices, all cloud orchestrated from your preferred data management platform. Uh, already green grass approved, Azure, Ignition, OSI Soft, and many more in the pipeline going through right now. Back to you, Albert. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for that detail there. That's, that's a great insight. So yes, you can reuse conduit gateways. I mean, we've done um, a lot of IoT projects in the sub gig band over the last couple of years, smart building, smart city projects using the conduit. And it was great being able to bring 2.4 to life, which is a new card. So um, that was fantastic for us. Um, so just for those who have joined recently, uh, we are going through um, asset and personnel tracking on LoRa at 2.4 gig and um, achieving less than five meter accuracy um, in a wide open space uh, use case. So keep the Q&A coming in the chat. Um, I'd like to now just dig in, and I see a lot of questions about performance and accuracy on the chat already. So Khaled Hassan, our IoT scientist on the Donalto team has a few slides, and I will also walk you through the application. So what, so what we actually did, what we experienced, and um, some of the detail in there. So um, thanks, Khaled, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Albert. Yeah, uh, actually, before that, I will talk um, uh, briefly about the technology itself and how it can be used in a localization or a positioning system. 
Great. And specifically, I will uh, talk about the two different ways to do ranging using uh, LoRa 2.4, and I will show the pros and cons of each one. So yeah, next slide, please. So yeah, LoRa 2.4 uses um, time of flight based ranging, which is known to be actually more accurate than the RSSI based ranging that's typically used in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as we saw in the earlier presentation. Um, and uh, as shown in the figure to calculate the time of flight between two devices, LoRa 2.4 uses two-way ranging method, which the master initiates the process by sending a ping to the slave and then the slave will respond back uh, with the ping act. And at, at the master side, uh, from the round trip time, the master calculate the time of flight between itself to the slave, and then can, can convert that into distance. And using that method, no synchronization is required between the master and slave, which is always hard in this type of scenarios. Next slide, please. Yeah. The, the actually, the, the, the other interesting uh, ranging method that LoRa 2.4 support is what's called advanced ranging. And advanced ranging is the ability for a, a third device to observe a two-way ranging session. And from the figure, you can see the advanced ranging device observes the two-way ranging session between the master and the slave. And from that, it can calculate the time difference of arrival between the ping and the ping act. So in that case, the advanced ranging device range itself to the session between the master and slave. And also in that way, there is no time synchronization required between the three entities, which is uh, always handy. So next slide, please. So uh, to solve an unknown location using the two-way ranging method, the device would require to range uh, with three known locations which could be the infrastructure of the network, like uh, LoRa 2.4 gateways, as we heard earlier in the presentation. And in this case, the solved location will be the intersect of the three circles, as shown in the figure. However, there are two downsides of using that approach. First is that the power consumption is high, as to localize a device, the device has to transmit three times and receive three times. And also, uh, the, net, the network scalability, which is low in, that, uh, in using that approach as well. As when the number of uh, devices increase in the network, the traffic increases linearly with that, which will increase the, the collision rate in the network as well. Next slide, please, Albert. So, however, by using the advanced ranging method, we can actually solve these two downsides. But first, to solve an unknown location using uh, the advanced ranging, the advanced ranging device has to observe two different ranging sessions and get two different uh, time difference of arrival. And in that case, the solve of that location would be the intersect of two hyperbolic curves. And in terms of energy consumption, the advanced ranging devices uh, don't require to transmit at all uh, for ranging, which can increase their lifetime uh, significantly compared to uh, using the regular two-way ranging. And in terms of uh, network uh, scalability, uh, you would probably uh, observe that the, range, the advanced ranging uh, is a scalable method, as a lot of devices could observe the same ranging sessions without adding any overhead to the network. Next slide, Albert. So this slide actually shows some results using the advanced ranging uh, way uh, from the deployment we, we saw in the, in the video earlier uh, in the workshop. And as actually LoRa 2.4 allows us to do the ranging using different configurations in terms of spreading factor and bandwidth. So here we study the accuracy in terms of uh, the mean error and precision uh, in terms of the standard deviation of that accuracy of all these uh, different configurations. So we have four splitting factors and three bandwidths for the ranging, which make uh, different uh, 12 different configurations that shown in the x-axis 
uh, at the top figure and also shown in the x-axis and the y-axis uh, at the bottom. And the most important finding from that slide is that uh, we can see increasing the bandwidth or the, or the spreading factor increases the ranging accuracy. However, the communication range and the power consumption have to be taken into account when choosing the right configuration as well. So it's, uh, it's not always uh, that, you know, the high spreading factor and bandwidth is, is right for your deployment. So next slide, please. So another experiment we did uh, is to see the impact of increasing the number of pings uh, per arranging session. And in general, uh, uh, increasing that number should reduce the impact of multipass and interference in the environment, which are the main reasons behind low ranging performance. So the top figure shows the accuracy versus the number of pings, where the maximum here is uh, 40 pings. And we can see that increasing uh, the number of pings reduces the mean error, which increases the accuracy of the ranging measurements. And, and to quantify that performance, we can see that with only five pings, we can achieve a mean error of less than three meters and a standard deviation of less than 1.5 meters. And in addition to that, a half meter improvement in terms of accuracy and precision can be achieved when the number of pings doubled to 10 pings. Uh, this, however, actually also uh, comes of uh, on, at the expenses of energy consumption, at more pings observed would require more reception time as shown in the figure at the bottom. So this actually points out an interesting trade off between uh, the ranging accuracy and the power consumption. I think that's uh, the end of my uh, part, Albert. So thanks, thanks for the time and back to you. Thanks, Khaled. So, uh, like a lot of the questions there are coming in are around um, performance, accuracy, multipath, etc. So we'll, we'll get to those. But I think those slides there did did really help. Thanks, Colin. So why are we tracking? What is the actual use case? Um, the use case that we engaged with with our um, customer last year was around personnel tracking in open pit mining for health and safety. So to that end, we created an application um, as part of the cloud platform, whereby personnel can be tracked very frequently um, at an accuracy of less than five meters. And this information is uh, presented visually here. So again, this is a wearable tag. It's a, a wrist base, which you would have seen in the video. This is the Miro Miko tag, uh, IP65, as Alex has told us. Um, and a key part uh, to this use case is being able to ensure that personnel are outside of a particular zone. Um, this zone is obviously in the mining industry, this is the zone where they will do blasting once a week. Um, a zone should be able to be defined on a, on a, on a map like here. And then uh, geofencing is obviously done to uh, ensure that personnel are outside or at least being able to measure how that is progressing. So um, on the right hand side, you'll see some statistics. And I think, you know, a key part of this is if we need a, an asset or a, a person's location every 30 seconds, uh, but we still want long battery life, we, we have a few considerations, you know. So if, if this uh, dangerous event, uh, for example, blasting, occurs uh, for two hours once a week. Uh, that is the period where we want very, very frequent location information. And outside of that period, uh, you know, possibly we want uh, less frequent information to preserve power, so that's key. Um, <clears throat> there's been some questions around indoor tracking and we'll definitely address those, but this has um, evolved into, um, it's taking the same approach and using this indoors predominantly in the logistics space and in the manufacturing space. Wide open spaces are obviously ideal. They're easier to control and easier to predict what your performance will be. However, we have seen um, concrete examples of where wide open spaces indoors, like in warehouses, like in large manufacturing plants, um, are very, very um, well suited to, to this type of technology. The reason being is the reduction in infrastructure. 
So if Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or ultra wideband was being considered before, and you can now use LoRa 2.4, you know, to um, connect up a warehouse space with, with much less infrastructure, there's obviously a great benefit there. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there are some aspects to the uh, platform which uh, we can show, and we'll, we'll do some live demos on the booth afterwards, please, if you'd like to join us there. And um, sometimes it's not just how many people or assets are inside or outside of a zone. Um, there are some examples of where condition um, of this um, instrumented asset or person um, is also very, very relevant. So um, I think we're going to take some questions here now. We see them flying through on the chat. So if it's OK, I'll just run through those. And um, we've had a great attendance so far. So thanks to everybody. And uh, Dan, Alex, and Khalid, I just might call on you for a couple of these as we go. Um, there's one there, actually, Dan, about the Conduit 300 and when this will be available in the EU. Yeah, so it's sampling to some lead customers right now. Our schedule for mass production is the end of this quarter. So in about eight weeks or so time is uh, our scheduled mass production launch date. So uh, so not long now. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. If you want so more information, you know where to come, uh, www.multitech.com, and uh, you can find multiple ways to contact us there. Excellent. Um, okay, we've had some questions about Laura Edge. Uh, is this competing? How does it compare and contrast? So obviously, in periods where you require very intense reporting, uh, there is a significant uh, power gain when using uh, Laura 2.4. This is all around campus uh, tracking, you know, <coughs> space, but obviously in this captive location. So if we think of a campus as a logistics space, a manufacturing plant, uh, an oil refinery, a mine. Obviously, LoRa Edge. If there's a wider LoRa WAN network available, and there you and uh, obviously GNSS is being used. When this asset or person moves outside of this zone or outside of this campus, they can also be tracked using this tracked using this technology. So, in certain cases, we see LoRa 2.4 having some benefits. However, we do see them as being complementary in lots of use cases as well. But in addition, okay. uh, Albert, you also get higher bandwidth with the 2.4 gigahertz compared to the sub G and it's easier to circumvent all those uh, duty cycle restrictions we have in the EU. So That's it's, correct. It's also, and of course, there are different distribution. I mean, the, the, the free, uh, free space damping is higher for 2.4 gigahertz, but um, depending on your antenna setups, you can also do, you can, you can also do low, smaller devices because of antenna sizes and stuff like this. Yeah. And that, that brings, that brings us on to uh, Dalton's question, which is the benefit of 2.4 against the gig. So as Alex has said, the lack of duty cycle limitations, that's actually how we achieve the accuracy that we're getting. Um, so I think you said there, that was partially answered. Uh, can a 2.4 gig gateway be used as a normal 2.4 Wi-Fi gateway for non-IoT devices? We haven't seen that. Dan might know more on, on, on that. Um. On the uh, the voice, did you say? Sorry, the question is around: Can a, a two point four gig gateway be used as a normal two point four gig Wi Fi gateway? Yeah, um, yeah. So absolutely, it can be. Wi Fi is an optional um, um, uh, an optional upgrade to a conduit uh, gateway. So if you buy the model, uh, I believe it's uh, two four seven in in the part number. Um, then it supports Wi-Fi, and absolutely you can use the Wi-Fi both as an access point to connect devices, but you can also use it uh, to be able to connect to a Wi-Fi network for backhaul, and, and that can work simultaneously with the LoRa. Um, we did um, a number of coexistence and interference tests. Um, our partners at Semtech also did some interference and coexistence testing, and there was really negligible impact on Wi-Fi, and, uh, and we didn't see any impact on, on the LoRa. So you can absolutely uh, do that. There, there was one other question as well about voice. Now, um, you, 
we, we actually had a number of customers come to us asking, can you do voice in 2.4 gig? We've not implemented it, but absolutely you can use 2.4 gig LoRa for voice. You would time slice it. So, you know, some of the time you're on the uplink, some of the time you're on the downlink and that higher data rate would enable you to um, cache data and be able to play it in real time. So, so we didn't do it, but you absolutely could do that. Yeah, we've seen some uh, experimentation there already, Dan. And that, that point about coexistence with Wi-Fi, that's a question that we get asked regularly, especially as we move indoors and there are some dense Wi-Fi networks. Um, but there has been some good evidence that's come out recently about the coexistence there. Um, so just on multipath, this has come up a few times, how does this affect the accuracy? So as we're moving indoors into our warehouse projects and manufacturing spaces, obviously, uh, even if it's a wide open space, we still have lots of obstacles. Um, testing is ongoing there. We actually have our first technical deployment um, next month. But Khaled, maybe you could comment just on how time of arrival and uh, TDOA algorithms are affected at, you know, just in a general sense. Yeah, so yeah, multibus, yeah, definitely it's, um, it's uh, the main reason for the bad performance of any ranging actually uh, missile. But yeah, the advanced ranging, what's, what's actually it offers here, it, you can fight the multibus by averaging over multiple pings. And that's, as I tried to show in my presentation, it gives an tra interesting trade-off between the, the, the accuracy of the measurement and the power consumption. So you could actually uh, eliminate the, the impact of the multipass if you have like average over 40 pings, but that definitely will, uh, you know, uh, will, will, not, will, not, will not let your device to live for longer. So that's the interesting part. Yeah. So the effect on battery life. Okay, thanks. Um, we've seen a couple of other ones just come in there. If LoRa 2.4 gig requires licensing like LTEM or NBIoT, no, so this is in free space. Um, it is in the ISM band. Um, the, there was a question around footprint of a tag, Alex. Now, one, point, one remark we got from a lot of customers was how how small the footprint is and how we're doing this on a coin cell battery, which was uh, quite appealing compared to some GNSS uh, devices, which would be quite chunky, right? Well, so that is his battery. Maybe you just want to comment on the, the, the footprint of the device. I don't remember the actual dimension at the moment, but it's we are working on a 2550 coin cell, which, which can supply uh, up 600 amp hour, a milliamp hours. Um, of course, you need a super cap on board, or, and you have to restrict yourself in, in, in the time you transmit, otherwise the battery will not be able to deliver all the current uh, you need for transmission. But we are uh, implementing uh, this similar systems um, in 2.4 gigahertz, um, where we run off this kind of batteries over uh, at least one year or even more. So it uh, selecting your battery in the system is crucial for the size, but it's also crucial for the system performance. But if you uh, follow a, a few guidelines or rules, you can also work off those very small coin cells. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very common question we get, you know, what what is the battery life compared to a GPS device? So uh, straight like for like, you know, obviously it, it all depends on how frequently you're reporting. but. Traditional GNSS uh, versus LoRa 2.4, we've seen a, a, a five-fold improvement. And then obviously you've got low power GNSS, which is part of LoRa Edge, and we've seen about it two or three times uh, the battery life on a LoRa 2.4 gig uh, tag. So um, I'm keen just to uh, draw this to a close. I think we've had a great um, interaction there with everybody and thanks for all the input. I did just want to, I suppose, uh, for people who are interested and who want to engage uh, with this technology, uh, we're actually holding a webinar at the end of February. Uh, we have an adopter program starting off, uh, which will allow people to try out these kits using um, the hardware from our partners here today, uh, Multitech and Miramico. So uh, please uh, drop your information by the booth and we'll send you uh, a link to register for that event um, to really bring this to life. So. You know, 
um, we've had a great experience here. We've been able to achieve the accuracy objectives and the low power objectives, and that, that, that was key for our customers. So uh, thanks for your attention. Um, I hope that was useful. And again, we'll be at our booth, um, Multitech and Miro Miko. Uh, Dan, Alex will be around. Find them on the chat. Uh, feel free with questions. And thanks to Alex and Dan and Khaled as well for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Right, thanks, Albert. Um, I'm going to leave and, and go, but thanks ever so much. I, I, I think that that was a very nice presentation. Uh, yeah, you did well. yeah. yeah, I think it was good, and thanks for you. You, you really go into detail there. I think that's very helpful for people. I appreciate that. All right, well, take care, and uh, yeah, look forward to getting the recording on this. Yeah, and I'll send you over the technical performance information we were talking about. I think we should have a catch up now in a week or two. Yeah. Perfect. Well, take care, Albert. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.